I'm going to do a two-part um, message or series, you know, a two-parter uh, called Adoration. And, uh, you know, when we're coming up on Christmas, I mean, uh, do you, with everything going on, still sense Christmas in the air? I know Haley does. She, she was freezing cold yesterday doing a Christmas parade. She's got her Christmas sweater on, uh, and I know she'll be festive again next week. Our kids all get so excited about Christmas that that Chris, um, he just couldn't stand it. And when Lisa and I were out here working, uh, he went through, and our garage has just got piles of, just literally piles of things that uh, we've been gathering and collecting and putting in there um, that we're going to sell some of it and uh, give any of it that we can and then dump <laughs> the rest. I mean, and it, I mean, it literally is piles. And, and there's been things that have just shoved to the back corner, which is where Christmas trees are. And, um, and he, on his own, climbed the mountains and got past ever, all the obstacles and, and, uh, and got that tree out. And usually I'll climb over and I'll kind of reach up and hand it over you know, to him. Um, uh, but he did that on his own and had it up. And then, of course, the kids... Yeah, we want all them to be there when we decorate, so they came and, and decorated. So we've had our tree up and uh, before Thanksgiving and decorated since Thanksgiving. Um, I think they decorated the day before Thanksgiving, didn't they? Yeah, and so uh, they're just they're so excited. We watched Christmas movies on Hallmark last night, and and we think about the Christmas season and the festivities of that, and it's 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 a blessing. Um, we get excited about that. And one of the, the great themes of Christmas is adoration, that we adore the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he truly is worthy. And we sang that this morning, that he alone is worthy. And he truly is worthy. And so I'm going to open up a, um, the message with a text from Psalm 95. And uh, we're going to go to verse number 6. Um, and uh, okay, Psalm 95 and we're going to read verse 6 and 7 to open this message it says O come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the Lord our maker O come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the Lord our maker you know that really speaks to, to what I want to share over the next two weeks, that, that, that he alone is worthy of worship, of adoration, of all glory, of all of our heart given to him. And, um, and of course, you know, within this opening text, we see that even in our posture, you know, um, uh, when we look at the scripture, and I've taught this, that, that there's not a requirement when you pray to be on your knees with your head bowed down and your hands folded like this or like this. There are scriptures where people stand before the Lord. There are scriptures where people stand, look up and pray to the Lord with their eyes open. There are scriptures where they kneel before the Lord with eyes open. Uh, closed, heads bowed. Um, there are scriptures where people in prayer are on their face before the Lord. The posture um, isn't uh, a certain limited posture that when you pray or you worship, um, but it's the heart in all postures, in all forms, whether you're standing with your eyes open and your hands raised, whether you're on your knees, um, with your head bowed and your eyes closed and your hands folded, um, whether you're laying before the Lord or whether you're driving your car, sitting with your eyes open and looking at traffic, but you're praying to the Lord and praising the Lord, that posture isn't the most important thing. Although, let's not neglect that if we're physically able. Now, some of us, you know, are getting to a point where if we get down on our knees um, and we don't have somebody to help us get back up, we could get in a little difficulty. 
And so God understands that. We all understand that. You know, and if you ever do get stuck, um, have your phone with you. If you ever, you know, by faith, <laughs> I'm going down. I'm going to go for this. Um, have your phone or your uh, your medic alert, you know, and, and call, and, and we can come rescue you and help you back up. Uh, but I even know that feeling, you know, <laughs> getting on my knees and sometimes... You know, I, 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 I need something, you know, to, to you know, a little bit higher than, than just the floor to get up, where before I could be on my knees and just hop up from there, you know, and you know, younger and more limber and flexible and, and all that. But God wants us to worship from our heart. And so it is good to, uh, to get into a, a prayer closet, so to speak, and get into a a physical position of humility. And that may be um, sitting in a chair because of our physical condition, um, but bowing our head, closing our eyes, folding our hands. The, the, the posture is part of that that closes us off to the world. We're not looking up at all the stuff that's going on around us. We're not listening. We're closing our eyes to it. We're bowing our head in humbleness before our holy God. We're holding our hands um, in, in a form of reverence. It's, you know, it's almost like we, we're, we can be holding him. Have you ever just been praying and just sense the presence of God and you just kind of, you know, just move your hands around? It's almost, it's not his hand in physically doing that, but there's just a love for it. And, you know, and you feel that. Um, posture can be important. But it's the heart, and it's the heart of the message. It's adoring him. It's adoration. And adoration is not reserved for a few weeks. You know, it used to be that you didn't do Christmas before Thanksgiving. They've been having Christmas all the way through the month of November, well before Thanksgiving. We live in the Ozarks, and we all know, you know, we lived in Branson for years. And, and you know, uh, Branson... A Christmas season starts officially in November. Everything shuts down the first week of November. It all gets decorated during that week, and then the second week of November, it's Christmas in Branson. And uh, and so we've been used to that ourselves for, for a while. Um, but because of the monetary interest of our society, um, Christmas starts getting out even before Thanksgiving. You know, uh, or not before Thanksgiving, before Halloween even, I've noticed over the last couple of years, you start seeing Christmas. I mean, not just one thing or two things. I've started seeing, you know, you know, displays start going up and cases of Christmas things and all of that, you know. And Thanksgiving has become a Christmas shopping holiday, and, and that's even starting before Thanksgiving now. Um, and, and so however long you say it, it's still a short part of our year, and adoration is not reserved for that. We are to be adoring the Lord, worshiping the Lord all the time. Well, Pastor, what is adoration? And what, what is it? You know that when it says, "Come, let us adore Him." You know, um, you know, we still use the word, but we use it less often as we did. And so, I just pulled up a definition of, of adoration. Um, Chris, I don't know if you made a slide out of that or not. Um, I'm still seeing uh, the, the scripture. Did you make a slide? No? Okay, just just uh, put the sermon title or write that out if you want. But um, adoration is the act of paying honor as to a divine being. It's worship. I mean, that's the first definition of adoration. The act of paying honor as to a divine being is worship. And so Adoration is really for the Lord. Uh, it's, it's paying honor, and you can say it in the natural, but it is paying honor to a divine being, the divine being, it's to worship. The second definition in that is reverent homage. Um, reverent homage. And, and that speaks to the the, the position of our heart, and it can be expressed physically, but to, to be reverent to the Lord. That we, we come to that place in, where we're really adoring Him, and it's not just a carol, 
but it's our heart-to-heart connection with God. Where we are just, with everything in our being, from our spirit, just giving Him all of ourselves. And, and, and valuing Him as the most important being in the universe. The most important person, the most important thing. There's no being, there's no person, there's no thing more important than Him. And that's what we're going to spend this two weeks just really reiterating and focusing that, that message. It's to have reverent homage. It's to, to give Him homage, to give Him glory. You know, we give homage to different things in life. You say, well, you know, how do we do that? You know, well, well statues are one thing. You know, monuments that get set up are one thing. We can drive around and see road signs that says Lewis and Clark um, traveled on this route here. You know, um, this important event happened here. This historical moment occurred on this place. And, and, and there's an homage that's paid to that. We think about that and focus on that. And, um, and so you can do that and, and say, well, you know, we don't build a lot. We've got people tearing statues down, which I think is tragic and sad, um, you know, uh, because once you open the door to things, you know, it's the old proverbial saying, you give an inch, give them an inch, they take a mile. And, and we see those kind of things manifested that <laughs> once the, the first statues started going down, then it went on. You know, tearing Abraham Lincoln down. He set the slaves free. And in the name of, of um, you know, uh, racial... Um, equity and everything else, they tear down uh, Abraham Lincoln, they tear down Robert, or not Robert, uh, um, Ulysses S. Grant's statue, Frederick Douglass's statue, <laughs> you know, uh, three of the prominent figures in, in, in history, um, but, but we have some tearing down. And so you don't all the time see new statues going up, but we do still direct monuments. There may be Facebook. You know, and it may not be as prominent, long-lasting. It can have an impact. Actually, you can have more people see your monument, your homage to something that you've set up, uh, to a, t- a, a time of family, you know, a family moment, a vacation, and you take a picture. You're recording a moment that Howard is going to cherish when, when he sees that next week. And so those videos are going to be cherished by him. Those cards that you're going to send him, that can be uh, an expression where you write how precious, or you say on the video, how precious he is to you, how much you value, value him, how much you love him, and, and, and it infuses something into him. And, and God is very interested in receiving like a sponge our worship, our adoration. And I'm sad to say that we live in a society where we have gotten so busy and everything has got, you know, so so many distractions that we're not having the quality time of adoration that we could and should. And I was going to say this part next week, but just to just Maybe we say it again, but you know, we have historically, the entire lives of our children and our grandchildren, had a, a, a family policy that on Christmas morning we worship God, we pray, we read the, we read the Christmas story, we worship Him, and we all pray before we open the presents. Because he is the reason for the season. He is our focus. He is our priority. And then with that mindset, as we share our gifts, we know that we do it in the name of the Lord. That it is a way of showing love for one another because of the love of God that is in us. And that's so important. So important to us. And so it's it's reverent homage, reverential honor, reverent homage. And then thirdly, it's fervent and devoted love. Fervent and devoted love. Adoration is fervent. 
with, with all of our being, with an energy, with an enthusiasm, with a zeal. Fervent. And when you say fervent, um, sometimes we talk about heat. Fervent heat. Biblically speaking, think about uh, the book of Daniel and, and the, the fiery furnace that Nebuchadnezzar had prepared for, for uh, Daniel to be thrown into. It was a furnace. It was hot. You throw a human body into that furnace, they're going to be gone. But he heated it seven times hotter. That's a picture. Fervent heat. It was already super duper hot. But just heated it. Just you know, put more fuel into that fire. And they pumped air into it to, to, to pump up that heat. And took it you know, up a level that where it was so hot that the people that cast him into it bound um, that, that they were consumed just from the heat coming out of the open. That's fervent. And so we are to love God with a fervent love, a passionate love, with, with zeal, with energy. And love, I just want to remind you all, is not a feeling. It's an action. There are feelings that can be attached to love, but love is not a feeling. Our relationships, our love relationships we have with one another and for one another are not feeling-oriented. Anybody that's been in a human personal relationship knows that they have their ups and downs feeling-wise. I mean, it's funny... You can do something as simple, and by the way, wife, this is not, I wasn't thinking about it, because I was thinking, that's unusual, because, um, have you ever ate chips? They're, they're, they're loud, right? Now, when everybody's eating chips, nobody thinks anything about the crunch, right? But have you ever noticed that when, when you're not eating chips, you're just silent, you're not eating at all? When somebody else eats chips, it can be like, you know. I she she pulled out some chips last night and, and was eating them, and it just it caught my attention. I thought, you know, should I get up and get something to eat or not? You know, we ate a later lunch or we had lunch, and, and so she was just eating some chips and hungry for supper, and, and so it just made me think. But it, it didn't bother me. But but I honestly have to say, there's times. In the flesh, it just it just like, you know, makes a hair on the back of your neck stand up. There are things that we can do that can grate on one another and, and periods that we can go through where we don't feel... The feelings are irrelevant. Love consistently is an action. It is sacrifice. It's selfless. It's giving of yourself. And so we are to be fervent in our love for the Lord. That is adoration. And so as we look at that, it just it, it becomes powerful. It's not just again a Christmas carol. And then let me um, I, I know if you didn't have the definition, it doesn't have this as a slide. But I put down some words when I looked at the definition that are related to the word adoration. And these words are admiration. Now think, in terms of, of adoration, for us to fully conceive, what is adoration? For us to fully get it. In that is admiration. Veneration. And I know some of these words we use more often, less often today than we do, but, but adoration, veneration. We've already talked about this. Reverence. Another word related to adoration is devotion. Devotion. Are you devoted? That means you were separated to it and, and totally give yourself to something. To uh, It is esteem. The word esteem is within uh, the words that were related to adoration. Esteem. This was an interesting one in the list of words related to adoration. Shine. If we're adoring the Lord, 
to the Rishonim. See, when you fell in love, people knew it. We watched a Hallmark movie last night, and the woman had a, a painful um, event happen when she was serving as a major in the army. She was a doctor, and and, uh, and so it, it affected her life. She she quit the uh, 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 the army after 15 years, and, um, and 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 was a doctor and decided she just wasn't even going to have roots, and so she was like a on a, not on on call. But it was on call. A doctor for hire, um, you know, where, where, say, a doctor would go on vacation or, you know, they would be injured or something would happen. And so she would go in for 10 days or 8 days or 2 weeks or 6 weeks or whatever it was. And she would just go and travel because she just didn't have connection to people and things. And, and of course, it's Hallmark. So there's a guy. And, uh, and the sister, it's Hallmark. So the sister and the brother-in-law surprise her. It's not Christmas yet, but they surprise her and they show up and say, we came to have Christmas with you and, you know, right now and be with you and that sort of thing. And, uh, and, and, and they looked at her and the sister said it and the brother-in-law said it. You look different. You, you, you look different. And the brother-in-law said, you look happy. The sister said, you look happy. Like you had a long, long time. See, when we adore something or someone, um, we'll shine. And do you remember that? Did people say, I can see you're in love, you know, and you're just kind of floating on air and you just shine. Our relationship with God should cause us to shine. In the book of Corinthians, um, it talks about Moses. Paul talks about Moses. And when he went into the presence of the Lord, we know the story that, that it caused his face to shine. And, and, and you can't watch it in the book of, uh, uh, you know, in the Ten Commandments. I, you know, I've always said I love the movie. Love Cecil, Mill, Cecil, Cecil B. DeMille's, DeMille, uh, DeMille uh, his, um, you know, epic movie, but it's so Hollywood and not Bible. You know, part of being in Christ, I enjoy watching the movie, not as much as I did when I first went when I was young, because I just thought that was the story. And it's a very loosely based on the Bible story, because the events in there didn't happen, and things that did happen aren't in there. And it's more supernatural just to read the Bible than what, what happened there. Although it is pretty cool the way they depicted the supernatural, and I like that. Big God, little gods, big God wins, little gods lose, people of God free. Love it. <laughs> okay? But one of the things that he depicts, and he just doesn't capture what the Bible has, is that when Moses came down from the mountain, it said his face shone and it was so the glory of God was had changed was on him and he was shining to the point where whenever he came down from the mountain and he would go up in the presence of the Lord at different times, but whenever he would come down it says he had to put a, a veil, he had to completely cover his head with a veil. Because the people just couldn't look at him for the glory. Now that's a pretty cool thing, isn't it? It, it? it didn't mean that his hair got, got wind blown or whatever you call it, permed out, you know, and, and highlighted with white streaks. I mean, Charlton Heston looked pretty cool when he came down from the mountain. But that doesn't even touch what happened. Because, see, they wouldn't have seen the blown out, you know, permed out, you know, fluffed up hair that just, and the streaks of white through it. I mean, that looked pretty cool. But see, this shining was so bright, so glorious, they couldn't even look at it. So if he was accurate, and, you know, and Charlton Heston is a highly paid actor, they don't like to cover themselves. You know, I was teasing Chris, I don't know what the deal is, but you know, those of you who watch The Mandalorian, the whole thing is The Mandalorian has to wear a helmet and can never take it off. It's part of their vow and their creed. 
I mean, I, I shouldn't say anything. Some of you watch it, and you know, so have you watched it since last Saturday? You know? All right, never mind. <clears throat> but he had to wear his veil. And, and this is what Paul said. The glory that Moses had on him doesn't even touch, I'm paraphrasing, but doesn't even touch the glory upon us that we shall see in this New Testament of believers. Are we shining with the glory of God? sang that song in a long time? Why? Well, that's a kid's song. Is that really a kid's song? Is that really a kid's revelation? Thank God we teach our children. Good grandmas, good parents taught some pretty girls a very important principle that we have the light of Jesus Christ and we need to let it shine. And Jesus told us to do that. To be like a, a house that sits on a mountain and you let the light shine from it. To be like a candle when you put it in the center of the earth and you don't put a bushel basket over it. You let it shine. You know, to bring illumination. Another word related to adoration is attachment. We're attached to God. We're attached to Him at the hip. See, when I, when I saw that word, when I was putting this message together, I thought about how a, how a kid, you know, just they get attached to you and they just want to go. Or even a puppy dog. When I, Toby knows, as soon as I walk in the bedroom and grab my wallet, he runs in there and his little tongue, you know, and, uh, and he's excited and he follows me and then I grab the keys and then he starts jumping up and down and he's like, um, and he follows me to the door. He wants to, Lisa calls it, hit the road or go on a trip. And so Toby knows to hit the road or, or go on a trip. Hit the road is just the short little uh, you know, errand across town. Go on a trip is the long thing. And so um, he loves to go. You know, Our kids, they love to go. That's part of adoration. We're joining the hip. We just want to be with them 
all the time. And when they get older and they become teenagers, they're not they're not wanting to go with with dad, with grandpa all the time anymore. I mean, with longing, they'll say, Do you want to go with me to church today? Do you want to go just be with me? And the rare yes. And it's not a yes. It's just a going. And the rare time, the bulk of that will be finding something to do. And he does. He serves out here so much. So he'll be back there and get his stuff set up for worship. He'll be on here rehearsing and playing music. He, he, he's not attached to me. He's not with me. He just accompanied me. And he loves his dad. And we spend time together. I'm not saying it's not. But you know what I mean. As we get older, that's different. And see, we'll do the same thing. Instead of being like Jesus said, worshiping him and approaching him like a little child, where we're attached, we cling with the hip. Well, that's, that's just a kid thing. I've got things to go, places to go. People will see text to text. Uh, uh, there is a new video service you all do now, TikToks to talk or whatever. What do they call that? Do you tick or do you talk? Or do you tweet? Get things to do. I like this one because we're part of the Ozarks. This is literally one of the words that, that are that are a, a part of um, or related to adoration. Hankering. In the Ozarks, we call it hankering. I got a hankering. You know, a hankering is just another way of saying just a craving. I just, I just gotta have it. You know, I got a hankering for catfish. I have a, I, I had a hankering for fried chicken, and Lisa scratched that itch for me the other day. I'm gonna tell you the one tragic part of being the pastor of Journey Church Ozarks is the utter lack of quality fried chicken in West Plains, Missouri. It is sad, but in every in every family there is there's issues. Every human being there's flaws. In West Plains, part of the Ozarks, for goodness sake, doesn't make quality southern fried chicken. I hear Linda does. Her family has a hankering for her fried chicken. That used to be her regular thing. And they get a hankering for it. You know what I'm talking about? A hankering. And so part of adoration is a hankering, a craving. I just gotta have it. Do we have a hankering for God? It's part of adoration. If we adore Him, we're gonna have a hankering for Him. Honor is part of adoration, but we honor Him. It's not frivolous singing and clapping and praise. You know, Brother Hagen and, and I know uh, Tina and did you read that too, Sandra? Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits. Um, Y'all read that? or, or was, Were you the one? You both read it, right? You bought it and then you read it. And so they, they read the whole book. And then the second part of the book it got into um, where the Lord showed him something about applause. And, uh, and, and something that the Lord showed Brother Hagen, that I had gotten um, years before I ever heard him teach this, years and years before, when that I was the associate pastor of our church in Illinois, and I've said this before, it's been a while, we had up on the platform, um, we, we had pews, the old mauve, you know, cushion pews, that's what they had in this building, um, you know, they took the pews, but, um, but, they, but we had the two-person mauve pew up here, and up here. And so the worship leader and an instrumentalist would sit there, and the pastor and I would sit on there. I hated it, you know, uh, just a thing. You know, so I just worship with you. I'm part of the congregation. And they're up here not to perform before us, but to lead us into the presence of God. That's adoration. It's not a performance. So many churches have turned it into a performance. And I don't mind, you know, um, 
having the pretty colors and things like that and a nice warm atmosphere and things. But sometimes we take the presentation and turn it into a show instead of leading us into the presence of God. And I'm not about that. And I'm not about, you know, that, hey, we're up above you and before you. I'm only here up on the platform out of convenience for everybody from front to back to be in the seat. Just a physical thing. And so I, I wasn't really a fan of sitting up there. I just assumed be there. Just assumed be where Molly is, actually. I think, hi, Molly. Be with us. And uh, she heard me singing. She heard me singing. I bet that's when she came in. And uh, we're going to sing some more, kiddo. We're going to sing some more. And you look very pretty with your Christmas sweater. So, um, so I'm sitting up there, and one thing I was able to do up there was to observe and see things. Um, I saw that, and, and when I saw that uh, that the, the, the young person last week when I was up here, and and part of children's church, and he had his hands up, worshiping the Lord for all of us, and I tell you, it was beautiful. And so that part was really nice. To be able to look and just see people shine. See people forgetting about themselves and, co- and concentrating on him. Magnifying his name and worshiping him. That was beautiful. Really enjoyed that. And I saw that. But I noticed that in, in observing, um, you know, and whether I was up or down, I, I noticed this. It was easy to see. That there were times... When we would enter into really worship, where we were just in adoration of the Lord, and because people became conditioned and learned in their exuberance, um, when you just praise the Lord, they, they were doing that. We used to have people say, "Give the Lord a hand clap, give the Lord applause, let's cl- let's clap," and, and 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 some of that come from the Old Testament, clap before the Lord, you know, clap your hands, all you people. There's a clapping with music and praise and that sort of thing is different. But, but the Lord spoke to Brother Hagin, and you can take it for what it's worth. This is not the Bible, but it is something I've observed years before I read Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits. Jesus, in this vision, that he um, open vision, Hagin, said, Men receive applause, I receive worship. And if you notice, as I lead you, that when we worship the Lord, I don't do the hand clap after every song. And, 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 and churches would historically do that. And people became conditioned for that. And so they thought the right response when they would sense that their exuberance and sense the presence of the Holy Spirit, oh, oh, praise the Lord. But when it switches, especially from praise to adoration to worship, I noticed that the, 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 the Holy Spirit, it's almost as if I could see the presence, the cloud of God's glory. I could sense that come in, and then somebody would do that, and it would lift. And then we'd do another worship song, and, and, and somebody you know, would do that, because that was just their condition, and the Spirit would lift. There was a quenching of the Spirit. And they weren't doing that to be quenching the Spirit. Or anything. And they didn't know. But I observed that. Very, very interesting. And so I, 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 I was, for years, before I ever read that book, ever uh, heard Brother Hagin teaching and preaching and, and writing it, um, was not one to do the applause and give them a hand clap. And all that. We applaud men. We Worship, we adore the Lord. He's higher than that. So take that for what it's worth. I just found it interesting. But in here, we see the aspect of this that we honor, honor God. Okay? Um, but it's not on a human level, it's above that. Adoration is beyond human honor. This word is such an important part of it passion. Passion. Passion is, is, is emotions. It, it does have that part of it. That we with a passion. So we are adoring the Lord. We do that and give of ourselves. Our feelings are going to catch up to that and get involved. There's passion in it. It's, it's fueled. It, it produces a, a response. 
passion can produce physical response. You ever been passionate about somebody and you just get all, you know, you know, you, you know I, you know, you can't, you know, you ever watch these Hallmark movies or other movies? It's in everything. You know, like to watch Hallmark. Like, you know, they'll be like, how do you know when you when you met the one? And, and what is it? You just can't. You, you just can't stand being with her. It, it's you know, like you can't breathe. Like, like you know, if there's something butterflies just go in your stomach. There's like a, a a lightness in your foot. You know, it produces a physiological, physical response. Passion, you know. Passion fruit. When you think of passion, what does it do? It's like it's full of flavor. Ooh, you know, it just it, it it produces that response. And we should be passionate about our infatuation. <laughs> our relationships, human wise, may start with an infat- infatuation, right? People are gonna love at first sight. And it's new. You know, mine is spiritual, but you know, I you know, my best friend told me he liked her and he was too shy to tell her and so I said, Hey, I'm Ray. This is Keith. He likes you. That was that was me dealing with that situation. And of course Throckmorton, for those of you who've been around here a long time, remember who Throckmorton is. Throckmorton, you know, actually Introduced, got the conversation started, and, you know, and until so she got you know, got her attention, and then, you know, and I said, you know, this is too much. Problem was that then I look over, I have my attention on her because he's you know, this person, and inside my spirit, and I didn't know a lot about the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Lord a whole lot at that point, but I knew God said something. He said, "That's your life." I had to go to my friend Keith and say, um, you know, he, he, he was not, he was in a very mainline denominational church, hard work, you know, type of thing. Um, and so I just said, Keith, we got a problem. I like her too. <laughs> but I knew what the deal was. And she can tell you, I went on a mission to seal the deal. That's your life. Got to do something about this. She was on a mission to stop me from doing that for a period of time. But when God says something, He doesn't change His mind. You know what He's talking about? She probably thinking, I wish that I would have known. Maybe I would have figured something better. I don't know. Keith's probably a multi has a wife homework cards and stuff. I don't know. But I'm the guy that God said, because if he says that's your wife, then obviously I'm her husband. And that's why she's called wife. If you ever do this in your life. Because it's a beloved term that's important to me because of what it is. That's my wife. It's who God said that that's your wife. And so I don't say wife like old man and old man. You know, ball and chain, like some people say, it's the life. And when I say life, it's not a, you know, you say, why don't you call her honey, baby, poochie, you know? I called her poo bear, poo, and things like that. And I go, she's, she's saying something like, you know, back in the day. <laughs> you know, but wife has never departed, and that's the reason why. Anyway, passion, uh, infatuation. It may start there, and you might need to just rekindle some of that again. And then the last two I'm going to give together in, in words related to the word adoration is exaltation and obviously worship. Adoration is going to be exalting the Lord, and I'm going to put them together in worship. I exalt the Lord. And we did that this morning. She didn't know what I was going to be teaching on, she may me know, you know, if you would tell me ahead of time, I could play music, and, and I could, and Chris is like, if you tell me the day before, I could play a song, and play a song, I think you did okay for this morning, on, on the fly, I think you did, pretty cool, made it real Christmas, it's adoration, 
he just did that just in a couple minutes this morning. And he's like, man, I could do so much better if you just give it to me before. Um, but we need to exalt in worship. But you know, the first song spoke of the glory of him. And the last song of the poem was speaking of the glory of him. And the worship team to come forward and sing the first song and the last song of the poem once again. So you can start to make your way up here. Um, but let me read to you um, a passage of scripture from Psalm 98. Um, just just, um, just read a few texts to you. I could save them for next week. You know what? Well, let me just save them for next week. But let me do this. Let me go, because um, we're going to go to Psalm 98 and uh, for we're going to do the book of Revelation, chapter 4. But what we'll do is um, let's just drop down to, or go back to verse 1 um, through 3 of Psalm 95. We started in Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. And, and the first verse says this, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. See, when we adore the Lord, when we're coming into his presence, when we sing and praise the Lord and gather his name, he's in our midst. And so God is here. And, and, and it's holy ground. And I'm not saying you have to kick your shoes off and things like that. I know in church, but it's one major church, and you know, they take their shoes off and go for them. You know, whatever. I don't care if you do. Hopefully, you know, you know, over from the situation, but I don't care. We're yeah. six foot apart. So, uh, you know, but whatever the position, whatever the posture is, I really want to exhort you to adore him. Next week is going to be a lot of this. We're just going to do these two songs in the end, but next week we're going to really worship the Lord, we adore the Lord. It says, um, let us come before his presence with his king. His presence is here. Let us shout joyfully again with psalms. In verse 3, for the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. Isn't he worthy of the adoration this morning? Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say amen to that. That's my prayer. Amen. He's worthy of our praise.